Um, so thank you so much for coming and I hope you enjoy this brief uh, introduction to understanding our unconscious bias. Um, also, welcome to the Sir George Buckley Leadership Centre and I'm so pleased, I'm absolutely thrilled to be able to deliver on this Masterclass series to you along with some very um, inspiring colleagues on the sessions that are being run on this series this summer. So I hope there are this session, other sessions um, that you're um, enjoying signing up to. My name's Jo. I have a background in art and dance. I'm uh, also, I, I have a background in travel, in fitness. I taught uh, English as a foreign language overseas for many years, running uh, language schools, owning and running language schools, and then returned to the UK in 2009 uh, and joined the business school at the beginning of 2013 to establish the Learning Development Centre. And um, all of my diverse skill set and a lot of work that I've done with international students come together under the umbrella of intercultural trainer. Um, and my teaching at the university and my PhD research focus on the development of master's students' intercultural sensitivity, which supports them in entering the global work place with the confidence to work effectively and engage effectively in diverse teams and I also design and deliver training for both staff and external business partners and um, intercultural training and where that can take us in understanding the worldview of others is uh, my absolute passion so I'm as I said thrilled to be here today so it's quite a whistle-stop tour today of unconscious bias and I think perhaps everyone's aware the government's recently suggested that un unconscious bias training doesn't work and to a degree they're actually right and because a 60-90 minute session is not going to be effective at all in eliminating or even making us conscious of our biases, as you'll see from this presentation. And what I'm going to do is start at looking where our biases can show themselves and talk about how it's completely normal and it's human to be biased. And once we're aware of this, we can then discuss, well, what do we do about it? And why are the government wrong in saying that it doesn't work? And what should we be doing in order to overcome and reduce our biases? So I'm gonna start with, I'm gonna ask you to use the chat, please. And it may be something that you've seen before. I'm going to ask you to read a paragraph and then I'm going to ask you to please type your answers, your immediate instinctive intuitive response to the paragraph into the chat. It is quite an old um, example, but um, so you may have seen it before. But if not, um, please just type your instinctive intuitive response into the chat. So here's the paragraph. Fabulous. So clearly you know, some of you either both fast thinkers or have seen it before that the surgeon is the mother. I actually did this yesterday um, with um, three uh, people who didn't assume that it was the mother and we do get a lot of uh, examples of, from students as well that it's the stepfather, that it's the grandfather and that the immediate response isn't the mother. 
which is our conditioning. However, what we're also seeing now, which shows how we're progressing, I think, is that people suggest that it's two fathers, which I think is very interesting as it's showing how we're growing and developing as a society, that it's the norm to have two fathers, which perhaps when this was written in 2007, people wouldn't assume. But a lot of people and the majority of people jump to the idea that it was a grandfather, it was a stepfather. So that's a very, very normal um, example of, of our biases. So, quick look at the nine protected characteristics. Just a quick reminder as we start that uh, these are the nine protected characteristics which are outlined in the 2010 Equality Act. And the reason these nine groups are, the, are protected is because they've each had to fight for their rights. And there's uh, there are lots of, this is just one example, and I'm not going to show this now, but if you go into YouTube and type in the privilege walk, they're really excellent examples of um, starting a race, and but um, a, a physical running race, for example. Um, and there are ones which don't just focus on race, a lot of them just focus on race, others focus on protected characteristics. And this one particular looks at colleagues in the workplace and you're asked different questions, depending on the question, depends whether you can take a step forward, which is the, and those questions are about your level of privilege. So we don't have it and it gives a very, very physical ex example of where we don't have equity and there isn't equity in, in the workplace or in life for anybody. And we're not all starting at the same point. And so it's really worth, spending a little bit of time and Google in YouTube a few of these privilege walks to see where, depending on how much privilege we have in our lives, how that how much advantage that gives to us. So I, I, I do suggest watching those. So a little activity, this is a colleague of mine who's very kindly uh, giving me her slide and uh, Essia Hussein, she's a prevent trainer for Calderlees and Kirklees. And I'd like to show you these images and just think about what information you get from each image and what your first impression is. And if you can also, again, as I, um, as I show them to you, if you could please type your initial immediate response in the chat. What do you see? A kid, lovely, a little boy, a child, a young boy. Next one. And he's smiling. Next picture, a woman, a girl, pretty woman, a pop star, a model. Great. Next one. Girl, a woman, a woman, a Muslim lady woman lovely next one friends friends female friends two people happy times friends lovely girls on holiday thank you next one old lady a late grandma Scientist, okay, elderly lady, old lady, older lady, elderly lady, granny. Okay, and the last one. Goth, yep. So, if I'm a bit slow, it's because I'm switching between things, so please do bear with. The Picture at the top left here, this is Xavier Gordon Brown, and he's an eight-year-old maths whiz. He's thought to be the youngest person to have obtained an A star in GCSE and an A in A-level maths. The top middle 
and the top right, it's the same person. And this is Shazrina Binti Azman. She's known as Ms. Zina, and she's a Malaysian fashion designer, a motivational speaker, a television personality, a humanitarian, and the co-founder of an Islamic lifestyle channel. She's also a former musician, a singer, a songwriter, a rapper, and a dancer. Bottom left here, this is Leah Totten, and she, she won The Apprentice, and she's a doctor. This old lady, the elder lady in the middle, this is, um, the her name is Melissa Ann Shepherd, and she's um, known as the Internet Black Widow. Um, when she was 88, she was responsible for luring three lonely old men uh, into the uh, on the internet to fall in love with her, and then she murdered them and took their money. And she was released from prison in 2016. And then here in the bottom right is Sophie Lancaster, and she's the victim of a vicious mob attack. Uh, she was murdered, and due largely to the campaigning of her mother, Sylvia Lancaster, the police now treat crimes against goths, punks, and other subcultures in the same way they treat racist and homophobic attacks. And her mother, Sylvia Lancaster, has been quoted as saying, when people see goths, they just see difference and they're scared of that. They don't see the person underneath. And the Sophie Lancaster Foundation has been set up uh, to provide educational group works that challenge the prejudice and intolerance towards people from alternative subcultures. And the, the point of this is, is to think we make assumptions. Our brains just make things very, very simple. We just see what's in front of us. Uh, based on our own conditioning. We would never pres presume that this lovely little, little smiling boy is a maths genius. Why would we? We're not conditioned to think in that way. We just presume these are girls on holiday of having a nice time. That's what we're used to. And when we see difference and anything that we're not used to, it, it puts us into a state of defense because our brain is reacting to difference. And uh, exactly as um, Sylvia Lancaster said, when people see goths, they see difference and they, they're scared of that. And so this is the, the point of, of our unconscious bias training is to be aware of the fact that it's difference that we're reacting to and that our brains are simplifying things to see things the way that we're conditioned to see the world and we don't see beyond that, and that's that's normal. So are human beings naturally biased? I'd like us to use the chat again, and I'd like us to do all seven of these questions um, and think about, so I'll give you a minute to think about which of these seven numbers you want to put into each of the gaps, and then uh, we can have, a, I'll have, and then I'll go through all of them together um, and see if you, you can see whether we were right or not, or whether you're surprised by any of the, the answers. So again, if you could put one to seven with those numbers in the chat, that'd be great. Or I could ask, um, Jordan's here, is it, is it better to use the chat, Jordan, or to unmute? I think I'd say the chat for this one. Chat. Be, yeah. Okay, fine, great. So if we can use the chat, that's lovely. Thank you. Lots of answers. So lots of variety in one from 59%, 40%, 33%, 10%, for one, 50%, that, so 20%. So lots and lots of answers for number one. Okay. Number two, what do you think about number two?
Number two, five, five, ten, six. Okay, good. Low numbers, 13. Good. Number three. Number three. I'm scrolling down. I can't scroll as fast as you can type. 13, six, 2%, 10%, 13, five. Okay, great. What about number four? Two, thirteen, six, fifty. Okay. That high. Number five. What are your thoughts for number five? Well, that's nice, Lauren. That's great. That's really good. Lots of nicely organized for me. Thank you. Number five, six. Emma, thirteen, fifty. Shona, fifty. Tom, fifty. Don, six. Okay. Number six. Over a million. Who's are out of work? Over 50s. Okay, and the last one, how many bosses said they would ask a candidate? What percentage, what percentage of bosses said they would ask a candidate whether she was pregnant at interview? 33%, 59% from Tom, 25%, 13, 6 one percent so lots of variety in your answers so to go through them the gender pay gap is currently around 13 i'm going to shrink this because i like to see reactions the current gender pay gap is around 13 percent so there are lots of questions about this because because for me, the data needs looking into further why and what sort of roles. And is that in just one role or is it generally across the board? The FTSE 100 female CEOs, there are six. There are more Daves and Steves than there are women in the FTSE 100 female CEOs. Only 1% of UK court judges are black and based on the population it should be at least four percent only six percent of people with a learning disability are in paid employment which is incredibly low 33 percent of employers questioned said they're unlikely to hire transgendered workers and those are those are those who were who were polled and those who were, were those the, uh, the people who were honest about their responses over a million over 50s out of work and 59 percent of bosses said they would ask whether a candidate was pregnant to interview which is incredibly high so it's 2021 and we don't have, equi we, we know we're near have equity. And I, we, hope, we hope there's more work being done, but it's, as we all know, it's not, it's not fast enough. So interculturalists, look at what what we can do and why um why it is what it is as we said our biases show up when we're confronted with the unknown and something we're unfamiliar with anything that's different and it comes from our culture we're conditioned by our culture our culture comes first the cultural neuroscientists are now able to see this using fmri using imaging we can see in real time what's happening um we used to think that the amygdala triggered the fight flight response it doesn't it reacts to difference when anything's different that's what we react to and in intercult the interculturalists which comes from sociology anthropology psychology linguistics there are lots of different definitions, but what cultural neuroscientists tells us that um what 
um, that culture is very, very simply patterns. And when the external patterns of our environment match the internal patterns of our being and of who we are, we don't notice culture. And it's only when something's different, it's only when the external patterns of our environment don't match our internal patterns, we start to notice difference. And we don't know what the appropriate behaviours are, we don't know how to behave or react, and that makes us defensive. So we're going to look at how that's a very, very normal response. Um, and in terms of unconscious bias, these physical and, and mental processes that are in play are our brains trying to make sense of difference and trying to simplify things. Our brains don't like anything that challenges our brains, quite frankly, are lazy. And we want to categorise and we want to put everything into a very neat box of what our experience and understanding is. And where this comes from is our social condition, uh, our social cognition. When we're young, our, our, cog our cognitive systems are very sensitive to the socio-cultural patterns in our environment in a similar way that they're sensitive to our linguistic patterns. So just as our native language becomes an integral part of our ability to communicate, we also learn to read the social patterns of our social environment and we develop expert cultural intuitions that we're not even aware of. And we learn to, the Japanese have the phrase, we read the air. And this comes from our lived experience, our family and friends who we associate with, what we read and what we watch and what we expose ourselves to, what we look at and read on social media and our travel. And I have, I, I had two colleagues who, who worked with me um, in my team um, and both staunch socialists, one of whom would only read The Guardian, the other who read everything and read the Daily Mail and said, I want to know what other people are thinking. I have another friend who, again, a very staunch socialist, who's a member of Boris Johnson's group, which is, makes a very interesting reading when she gets into arguments with people online because she wants to know what people are saying. And so a really useful exercise is to make a list of five to 10 people who you trust, and it can't be your family. So people who you would go to for advice and how wide is that list? How varied is that list? Or do all those people conform to how you see the world? Or are you opening yourself up to new experiences and stepping outside of your own comfort zone? So a really crucial person in, in terms of bias is Daniel Kahneman, whose book is Thinking Fast and Slow, and whose new book coming out in August is Noise, which talks about errors which we make. And in the Florida experiment, Kahneman's a Nobel Prize winning laureate, and as I say, over 20 years focus on bias. And he says the brain has a need to filter information and identify what's important. And he cites in terms of priming um, the Florida experiment and he talks about the Florida effect, which was an experiment run by John Barge at New York University. And he was asking students to sort sentences. So he had groups of 18 to 22 year old students and they were asked to form sentences of four words from five jumbled words. So for example, finds he it yellow instantly, a four word sentence, he finds it instantly. And the students were split into two groups and one of the groups scrambled words had the words like Florida, elderly, grey. And then after they'd sorted these words into sentences, the students were then asked to walk down the corridor to complete the second part of the experiment, which was in a separate room along the corridor. What the students weren't aware of was the experiment was actually measuring the length of time that it took to walk from one end of the corridor, from one room to the next. 
and the students who'd had the elderly words took significantly longer to walk along the corridor because they're primed. So, and our, so our social circles prime us for what we see and what we don't see and what we're exposing ourselves to. So I have a little, I hope this is going to play. I'm always nervous about playing videos. So a little test. And again, you may have seen this. So because of what we're primed to see, our intuitions are flawed. So I hope this plays, fingers crossed, and I hope you can see it. So it tells you on the task, it's the monkey business illusion, and it tells you on the task what to do. So I shall start this. The monkey business illusion. Can you hear it? Can I get a thumbs up, Fab? Count how many times the players wearing white pass the ball. Quick type in the chat as to how many times. Eight, three, three. Stuart says he saw the ape. Tom saw the ape. Carmen saw the gorilla. Very good. Did you? see the gorilla and get a count. Well, let's have a look at what the count was. The correct answer is 16 passes. Did anybody get 16? Oh, oh, oh you got 16. Did you, Shona got 16. Did you get 16 and see the gorilla? Exactly. You can only do one thing at a time. We can only focus on that thing that we're focused on. Let me carry on playing. Did you spot the gorilla? So some of you saw the For gorilla. For people who haven't seen or heard about a video like this before, about half missed the gorilla. So it's normal to miss it. If you knew about the gorilla, you probably saw it. But did you notice the curtain changing color or the player on the black team leaving the game? Anybody see the player on the black team leaving? See the curtain changing color? Let's rewind and watch it again. Here comes the gorilla and there goes a player and the curtain is changing from red to gold. When you're looking for a gorilla, you often miss other unexpected events. And that's the monkey business illusion. Learn more about this illusion and the original gorilla. Okay. So it's what our brain is priming us to do. It's what, depending on our social cognition, depending on what we expose ourselves to, is what we see and so we're seeing the world through our own lens our own social condition and we're not seeing the world from anybody else's eyes and we're we're missing things so this is our unintentionally flawed um, way of looking at the world and our inattentional blindness Gorilla experiment at theinvisiblegorilla.com. So how does it all work? We can think of ourselves as having three brains and two minds. And our three brains are the neocortex, 
the limbic system and the reptilian brain. And the neocortex is this frontal thinking brain which undertakes the complex tasks, um, the, the real um, critical thinking. The limbic system manages our social behavior. That's the feeling emotional brain and is very, very important. And well, as they're all important. And then the reptilian brain is the oldest part in our evolution. And this keeps us in homeostasis. It's keeping us safe and it's healthy, uh, keeping us safe and healthy. And it's the instinctive brain. It tells us when we're hungry, it tells us when we're tired and it doesn't switch off. And it's primed, even when we're asleep, there are times when if you think of a parent with a new baby and the second the baby cries, the parent will wake. Um, and so it's programmed to notice and react to difference. And if something's different, this reptilian brain does not know if it's friend or foe, safe or unsafe. So this ancient, ancient million, millions of years old brain reacts to difference and it put it sends us into the fight, flight, freeze response. It's constantly primed and ready to go as soon as we see something different. And it's incredibly fast. So if we think about a car coming around the corner unexpectedly, we don't stop and sort of say, well, hmm. What's the best thing for me to do in this situation? Shall I stand here in the road for a little bit? Shall I go across the road or shall I go back? We just automatically either run or jump back. And we see this all the time when we're crossing roads with friends and the friend runs and one person doesn't because we're not thinking about it. The reptilian brain takes over and there's no thinking or thought about it. There's no consideration. So this reptilian brain primed to be cautious of anything new or different and in terms of um, cultural difference what we want to do and in terms of difference in terms of people seeing the world through, through a different lens and, and our social con cognition and our social word we need to start engaging our neocortex and becoming aware so that the, the, we're not making these um, errors of judgment and this using employing this inattentional blindness blindness okay? and as i say our responses are heavily influenced by our previous experience and guided by intuitive judgments and and motivational motivational urges that we're only partially conscious of now the two minds are our intuitive mind which is largely unconscious conscious and fast and our attentive mind which is managed by our thinking brain and this is conscious and slow and it would rather let the fast mind do the work and this comes as i said from kahneman in the book thinking fast and slow and the unconscious brain is in charge 90% of the time and it's processing 11 million bits of information per second, but it can only manage 40 bits of information and it wants things to be simple. So enter heuristics. I'm gonna play you another short video and I'm gonna stop it for, let me, I have to close things down and open things down, open things up, open things down. And then I have a quick question in the middle. So if I just open up the chat and then I can see your responses. Um, this is made by a student. When it loads up. dollar ten for a bat and a ball how much does the ball cost 
if the bat costs a dollar more than the ball. One, impossible to know, 0 0.1, 10, okay, nine, no idea. <laughs> One dollar five, Stephen. Okay. <laughs> Let me carry on playing for you. Find my mouse. Ten cents, which is the normal answer. Ten cents. Bat and a ball. Dollar for the bat. So ten cents for the ball. So most people. <laughs> So is that Stephen? Well done. Our brains like things to be simple, they don't want it to be complex, and they will make things incredibly simple based on our social cognition and our experience. So Caputo in 2012 identified 21 biases. However, on Wikipedia, there's a list of 188 cognitive biases, which are divided into 20 major categories categories and each category relates to four different challenges of perception and cognition. The first being a limited ability to remember. Remember 11 million bits of information but we can only process 40. A need to filter information and identify the important stuff. So based on our social experience and our life experience and our own individual worldview, we take out what sticks out for us and makes it simple and, and makes it so we can accept it, we simplify it. The need to make judgments and or, interpret, or interpretations based on limited information and the need to act quickly in the face of uncertainty. And this is what our brain is doing. Generally speaking, we believe that biases imply there's something wrong with our cognitive processes and that we're stereotyping. However, in terms of our evolutionary biology, stereotyping is useful. It allows us to make judgments quickly and stay safe without having to engage the slow, lazy system to thinking. Because that little patch of yellow grass over there just might be a lion. And our ancestors who reacted quickly were the ones who survived. And I'll show you briefly this is, you can find this on Wikipedia, it's the Cognitive Bias Codex. And there are 188 different biases, depending on how we are socially conditioned. To show you briefly the nine key biases, we start to develop prejudice from the age of two. And of course, at that age, we don't question. And our values tend to be set by the age of 20. But these are the key ones that we need to start engaging that frontal neocortex and being critical thinkers and being aware of these biases. 
So an affinity bias is where we're biased be when we share gender, age or skin color, remembering that the brain likes what it's familiar with and it's easy to make sense of those patterns matching. It doesn't want patterns that don't match. The brain, it sends that anything that's different that causes the amygdala to react, which creates the fight, flight, fight, flight, freeze response. A self-serving bias is where we believe we're more capable than we actually, or more intelligent than we actually are. Most people believe themselves to be better drivers than they actually are, or blaming a negative outcome on circumstances rather than on ourselves. Confirmation bias is where we interpret information to support what we already believe and only remember details which uphold our beliefs and we ignore information which challenges our beliefs and we don't seek out negative facts. Conformity bias is behaving like those around us rather than using our own judgment. Bene benevolence bias is where the, the, the line manager, for example, gives somebody a task because they're being kind. So, for example, a new role involves travel and um, this person who's the main childcare provider doesn't get the job because the line manager thinks, oh, well, I know you, you, you pick up the children from school, so I've given, the, I've given this promotion to this person and making those assumptions. Attribution is the most common form of bias in the recruitment post process because it's our brain's flawed ability to assess the reason for certain behaviours and it manifests when reading a CV. And um, studies were done where they took, um, they took a set of CVs and on one pile, in, in a, it was in a white Western context, they put white Western names on the pile and then non-white Western names on the other pile. And this pile got 16 callbacks for interview compared with nine. So purely due to the name. And it comes up when, when you see two people in the office talking and making the assumption, or oh, they're talking about me. Halo bias, where we see something great about someone and let that judgment influence other unrelated areas. And of course, horns being the opposite. And beauty, obviously speaking for itself, that it works both ways, judging somebody positively or negatively based on, um, on, appearance, on appearance. But the biggest bias is fear of the unknown. And looking at the uh, impact of that, that we're not even aware of how, um, because it's so part of intrinsically of, of, of conditioning, social conditioning, that people are not aware that they're paying less attention to someone who's different to them or not showing the same level of empathy, which in my work, the, the focus is very much about developing empathy for somebody who does not being able to empathize with somebody's situation when they their view of the world is so completely different to your own um, not thinking when you're speaking and speaking ab abruptly acting defensively in speech or body language unaware um, and leaving people out without even being aware of it and it's really important to, to talk about and think about microaggressions in that there's a lot of discussion about this term microaggressions uh, because they, the person committing the my want of a better word, the microaggression, uh, it's small, but the impact on somebody is not small. So Tiffany Janner and Michael Barron use the term subtle acts of exclusion. It's subtle because people aren't aware and don't notice it, except for the person who it's impacting upon. And I think, you know, the thing to remember as well is um, that, you know, if, you, if ever you're not being uh, given a job, uh, you don't get even interview, don't ever take that personally, personally because clearly there's, there's a lot about it being the bias of the person who, who's doing the, the um, selection or in the recruiting. And um, just a note that I'd made here was that um, in terms of subtle acts of exclusion, uh, Tiffany Janna is CEO of TMI Portfolio, and that's a collection of socially responsible and interconnected companies who are working to advance more culturally inclusive and equitable workforces. Uh, Michael Barron, a uh, social scientist at Harvard, and uh, has been a researcher at the American Institutes for Research. So what my work is underpinned by and uses is 
um, the developmental model of intercultural sensitivity. And it moves through six orientations of denial, defense, or reversal, minimization into acceptance, adaptation, integration, where somebody who has a denial world view of the world, difference is avoided and not noticed. In defense, that the focus is divided very much into us and them. So this is a demonstrating, you no. Know, so somebody, for example, who hasn't had a lot of exposure to difference and feeling very threatened. And then this moving into minimization where we tolerate superficial diversity, thinking, well, we're all the same. Um, when actually we're not, it, it's, it's, this all comes down to ethnocentrism. It's not okay to say that, you know, you're the same as me because somebody else's experience is very, very different because I'm still viewing the world through my own lens and, and making comparisons. Um, and then what we want to move it to is accepting and being curious about difference and respecting the other to have a different view of the world to me and then developing our ability to adapt to others world views and being able to act with empathy and, and sensitivity which then this lifelong process of integration where you can move in and out of other worldviews according to the context and this is about being an ethno-relative where we accept somebody else's views of the world and it being different to ours however without this training i'm going to show you the statistics we have a perceived uh, we, we run um, it, the Intercultural Development Inventory, the IDI, it's a tool for measuring people's levels of intercultural sensitivity. And our perceived orientation, nobody believes themselves to be in denial. Nobody believes themselves in, to be in defense or reversal. 13% of people, so overall only 13% 30, 30 of people who undertake this IDI test, which we run, I'm an administrator for the IDI, the globally recognized tool. Only 13% of people tested believe themselves to be um, ethnocentric, but 81% of people believe themselves to be accepting of difference, and 6% um, believe themselves able to adapt. It's not measuring integration because integration is this lifelong process where we're always coming up against difference and people who see the world and experience the world differently to ourselves. However, the, what the, the tool also does is measures your developmental orientation where we actually how we are actually seeing the world five percent of people without training in denial 21 in defense 66 people oh we're all the same on my terms only seven percent in acceptance and one percent in adaptation which means that without training 92 percent of people have an ethnocentric worldview so I know we're going over in time. So what can we do? We have to recognize, we have to engage, we have to really start working with the neocortex and recognize these blind spots and inattentional blindness of learning to let go of what we learned and pay attention to our internal landscape. That's the physical experience in that in the West we've mind and body have become very very separate but we need to be aware of what's happening in our body and those physical reactions to realize hang on my bias is at play here because i'm physically responding to difference so paying real close attention to the fight flight freeze and flock flock being sticking together with with people who are like us and people who think like us so we have to practice critical thinking and acknowledge our social conditioning and step out of our comfort zone. And I say be a lobster because what lobsters do is their shells don't grow. So they have to go through this really incredibly difficult process of breaking out of their shell to grow a new one and to grow this new, new shell and be a new being. And that's what we have to do. And it's tough, but we have to do the work. So we, if we develop our intercultural skills, to help us learn how to accept and adapt to others' worldviews and develop that empathy. The Harvard, if you just Google Harvard IAT, the Harvard Implicit Association tests, there are so many different bias tests that you can do, it's all free. 
people who you trust to bias check you, people who you trust because it is a lifelong process. It can't be done like the government says, you know, a, a, a 60, 90% um, session isn't working. Of course, it's not working. It's a lifelong process. So we need to grow our circle of people and have somebody who we trust to say, Joe, I think you just demonstrated some bias there. And then you listen and learn. So we have to engage in that conscious ongoing bias training. So as an organization, we have to develop our active listening skills, listen to what people are saying and be open to that and be prepared both individually and as an organization to learn. So our organizations need to provide ongoing 60, 90 minutes isn't enough. It's, you know, I've, 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 I've been doing this specific intercultural work now um, for six, seven years, very focused and still learning. And so providing, we have to provide staff training, provide space for the conversations and provide support for that ongoing life learning, like lifelong learning to move one orientation from denial to defense or defense to minimization on the IDI is 24 hours of um, concentrated input. So we really have to put minimum. And if most people are ethnocentric, it's a lot of hours that we have to provide for our teams. So supporting staff development of those intercultural skills to be able to accept, accept and adapt to other worldviews and educate ourselves. I've put read, 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 because um, I know um, I can see hi Berenice. She and I talk about we've got stacks of books to get through and then watching things on television and talking to people and listening to information that perhaps you wouldn't previously have um previously have, have, have looked at or read. And so the reference is there. Um, that summarizes my presentation. I know I haven't left very long, there's five minutes for questions. Um, the next session is on the 19th of August from boot room to boardroom with John Gray. So the, the same, uh, you Google the George Buckley Leadership Center for or Eventbrite uh, or get in contact with Jordan to sign up for that. Um, and the CMI level five and several accredited programs start in September, um, or you can do a one-to-one -one diagnostic with Sue Alderson. Um, so, and details are on there on the following slide. Thank you so much for coming. And I've done a lot of talking and I hope it's been interesting and useful for you. And if you've got any questions, I'm here. And I've gone over, but I'm, I'm here. If anybody has any questions um, and do, of course, please do email me should you wish to go to the chat.